That was to show us that he was who he was. That he was Lord and Savior. He conquered death, hell, and the grave just like he said he would. And he has all things worked out this morning. Let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. And we'll be reading from verses 5 and 6. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. And the Bible reads, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. With the help of the Holy Ghost this morning, I'd like to preach on this talk, the closeness of Christ. The closeness of Christ. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns with high, but there's none like you, Lord. Once again, we come before your throne, just rebuking every attack of the enemy that should come our way, Lord, and just place a hedge of protection around about us, this church, its members, that no attack penetrate, Lord. I pray, Lord, that our hearts and our minds would be in one mindset, Lord, and that they would be plowed, that they would be good soil for your word to fall, Lord, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that it would take root in our hearts, that we would be transformed into your very image even farther. And anoint my mind and my lips to bring forth the words that you have us to hear this morning. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The closeness of Christ. And we look here at Hebrews chapter 13, we would discover that it is the very last chapter of the book. The author of Hebrews, whether you believe it's the Apostle Paul or somebody else, it doesn't matter. But as we look at the conclusion, they're wrapping things up. They have that holy nature where he's making his final points. And as he's going along, it's almost as if he's making a to-do list for the church, for those Jews. He tells them how to treat strangers. He tells them to how to treat those that are facing adversity. He talks about the sacredness of marriage. He talks about the importance of your speech. Let your conversation be with grace. And then he gets to the passage that we're reading. And be content with such things as you have. You realize that this passage is very applicable to the world that we're living in today because we all need to learn to be content with what we have. So many people look at what others have and say, why don't I have that? Why don't I have that? But the Apostle Paul if you want to say that's who's writing, obviously that's who I think wrote Hebrews, but he's giving instruction to be content with such things as you have, and he states the reason. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, being, speaking of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on even farther. The reason that is, so that we may boldly say that the Lord is my helper. You realize that there are so many times in life that if we wouldn't be in that situation or that predicament and God moved, we'd be boastful and saying, well, I got myself out of it. This happened. That happened. But be content with such things as we have because we know that Christ said he will never leave us nor forsake us. And the reason being is that we may boldly say, he is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. No. We need to be content with such things that we have because Jesus is our helper. And you know, that's not just a physical state of being. So many times we talk about it and we apply it to what we have physically. If we go back to our early 20s or when we first got married or when we were just starting life, how much earthly, how many earthly possessions do we really have? 
compared to what we have now. You know, even in my own family, it's hard to buy Christmas presents because everybody has everything. And the reason being is, well, if you want it, you have the money, now you just go out and get it. Or if you need it, you go out and get it. But think back to how God moved in our lives back then. You know, maybe we weren't able to pay a bill like we thought to get the money ended up being there. Or we always survived. We always had a roof over our head. You know, there's some people that all they have to eat is bread, if that's the case. But how many in our own lives we've been fortunate enough that we've never been stuck in that situation? We've always had plenty of food. We've always had a roof over our head. The bills have always been paid. And we might have been dead, but maybe it was a quote-unquote necessary debt, if you want to call it that, because it's hard to get away from the mortgage. It's hard to get money saved up to pay a house off completely. We're not all spending, but you know, those bills were always paid on time. Whatever we needed, God always provided in the right time. He never forsook us. He never left us. And we can look back and say, we may not have had a lot, but we were content. We may not have had a lot, but our needs were always met. Because God has been our helper. As we go throughout our life, though, how many times have we needed him spiritually, emotionally, mentally? You know, it's not just a, fi a financial thing. It's not always just a physical thing. Scripture doesn't say to be content with just the physical things that you have. But we can be thankful for our mental state. We can be thankful for uh, our uh, emotional state. This morning, none of us are in the state penitentiary. None of us are in the loony bin. We can sit here in a right mind. We can sit here with two arms and two legs. There's some people that don't even have that. And we can look back and say, I can be content because God is my helper. He's helped me along every step of the way. You realize that Christ is our helper in more than ways than we could ever dream or imagine. The first thing I want to look at this morning is that Christ sympathizes with us. When you look at the definition of sympathy, it's an inclination to think or feel alike. It's like me coming down to Brother Russ and saying, you know, Brother Russ, I can sympathize with you. It's not empathy, but, you know, I can kind of get a feeling for where you're at. I may not be all the way in the boat, but I can somewhat relate. When we look at sympathy, that is exactly what it is. An inclination to think or feel alike. In Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24, the Bible states, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You realize that Jesus Christ is our friend that sticketh closer than a brother? You know, we have family and friends, but sometimes they're not always there for us. And sometimes the reason they're not there for us is not because they're not nearby, it's simply because they don't want to be there for us. I have been very blessed in the fact that my family has always been there for me. My pap, anything you need, you let me know. I'm there for you. When I came to buy in the car, I had to get the cash out gradually because of the limit every day. The money was there, but I had to get it out. That come on down. I went on down. He handed me cash. He goes, you go pay it off now to make sure you have it. You just pay it back to me when I get it. My uncle, before we came out of here, you need any two by fours? Where are they on the pile? They're fit in the truck. Throw them in the truck. <laughs> Him and my pal have always been that way. Don't go buying any wood. We got plenty of wood. Just come and get it. You know, there are some families that aren't like that, though. I used to work with a gentleman that him and his family, whether it was brother and sister, parents, they were constantly backstabbing one another. They were all constantly undermining one another. They were always, well, I'm going to charge my brother an excessive amount for this. That mentality is far from me, but there are people out there that their own family is like that. Some of their friends are better to them than their own family. How many of us can look back and think about the situations we've been in? And whether we had family that was with us every step of the way, whether we had friends that were with us every step of the way, or maybe they left us sometimes. 
You know, so human nature is, well, I don't want to do that, so I'm not going to do that. You know, that's simply, Brother Russ, you may need help doing something, and I may feel your pain, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to go come and help you out. I mean, that is sympathy. I feel what you're going through, but you know what? I'm not completely committed. I can kind of get the base level. But Christ sympathizes with us in the fact that he said he will never leave us nor forsake us. He is there with us every step of the way. And the Bible states, even until the end of the world, in Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. And you can come back from sympathy. Maybe somebody's walked right alongside you, but they're only going to do as much as they have to, or maybe the bare minimum, if anything. Because that, truth be told, that is sympathy. I feel your pain. It doesn't mean you do anything about it, but I feel your pain. I can somewhat relate. But Christ feels what we're going through. Sometimes people can be heartbroken for us, but they cannot really feel or even imagine what we're going through. You know, maybe Brother Russ or um, Brother Andy or Brother Cam's going through a hard time. I may try to sympathize, but I don't fully understand it. You know, there are things in this world that people go through that I've never had to go through. I've never had done drugs, so I don't know what it is to come off the addition end of it. I've never smoked, so to go through a situation that maybe I'm battling lung cancer, cancer, I've never been in that situation before. You know, for someone who's maybe lost a child before it was even uh, duration, a stillborn or whatever, I've never been there. I can't experience that. I can try to sympathize with you, but I'm never going to fully connect. Jesus sympathizes with us. But he not only sympathizes, he empathizes. He shows empathy. There are four times in the scripture where the Bible states that Christ was moved with compassion. You know, it wasn't just sympathy. He had those feelings, but empathy, because then he did something. Every time when we see, I shouldn't say every time, but when we look at scriptures and we see where Christ was moved with compassion, it might not have been something that affected him directly, but it was somebody needing a healing touch and a touch into his core, and that moved him. You realize a lot of times when the hand of God is moved is because somebody's reached out and touched God. He's been moved with compassion. And when he's moved with compassion, it brings him to the state of empathy. Not that he's not always there. Because the Bible states that he is a high priest that is touched by the feelings of our infirmity. I may not be able to understand what you're going through if you battle cancer. But Christ does. I may not know what you're going through if you feel like you're having a mental breakdown. But Christ does. I don't know what it feels like Perhaps when it feels like you're going through the darkest, 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 darkest valley spiritually. But Christ does. He is there with you every step of the way. And he not only sympathizes, but he empathizes. Empathy, the action of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, an experience of another of either the past, present, or present without having the feelings and thoughts and experiences experience fully communicated in an objectively explicit manner. I may not be able to relate to every situation that everyone's going through. I can come by and try to be the best pastor, help you through it, guide you, but that doesn't mean I'm always going to I'm not going to know exactly what you're going through. I may be able to sympathize, but I'm not ever going to be able to possibly fully show empathy because I've not been there. I don't know those feelings. I don't know those emotions. And no matter how much I try, I may never get to that place where I understand. 
I may never be that to that place where somebody you can tell me something. It's like, oh yeah, I've been there, done that. I know what you're going through because I don't. For the vet who's going through a battle in the Agent Orange or even postpartum depression from war, I've never been there. But Christ has. For those soldiers who have been off to Vietnam and come back, I used to work with a guy who would come home right after Vietnam and he would sit downstairs in the dark awake at night. His wife would come down because he's not in bed wondering what's going on. And all he would say is, it's too quiet. It's too quiet. That may not mean anything to her, but for him, when it got quiet over and off, that meant something big was about to go down. You know, I don't understand that. And I can try to sympathize. But Jesus knows exactly what they're going through. Amen. Regardless of what it is. People may try to sympathize and empathize, but only Jesus really knows. He is the only one who is titled to the phrase, been there, done that, when it comes to knowing what you're going through. He is the one who can legitimately say that I've been betrayed by everyone around me. He's the one that when everything's going wrong, who has to still deal with what's broken around him when it comes to individuals. You know, friends, family members, they can try to relate. They can try to show it. But there is only one who truly knows what it is to be broken for each one of us. And that's Jesus Christ. And he went above and beyond more than we could ever dream or imagine. And not only does Christ sympathize, not only does he empathize, but you know, he provides. You know, even if I could come down and empathize with exactly what you're going through, if I could know exactly those feelings, those emotions, and be able to tell you the way out, I could never provide the way out. Because that does not come through me. There are lots of situations that I may show you the way or show you scripture, but I can never provide. But Jesus not only sympathizes and empathizes, but he provides. He is there with you every step of the way. In John chapter 2, going down to verse 5, the Bible states, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. We read this passage time and time and time again. But if we would place ourselves in the shoes of the wedding couple, the ones that were providing everything, can you imagine what they would have thought when they realized they ran out of wine, they didn't have enough? I mean, wedding days are stressful enough for the men because we have to deal with the women that are all stressed out to begin with about three months before that. I remember on my wedding day, sitting on the steps of the church on the inside, and I one of my best friends had come rushing out in a panic because she had found a spot on her dress. No, that wedding day has to go perfectly for the majority of people. Can you imagine being at the wedding at Cana when they ran out of wine? I mean, realistically, stepping back from the situation, it's a physical thing. Is it really that big of a deal? But it's still an issue. And while Jesus wasn't, it wasn't his time to step up to the plate, but because his mother intervened, he did a miracle. Jesus provides for us physically. In John chapter 19, verse 26 through 28, when Jesus say, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, and that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. 
We have Jesus Christ <coughs> dying on the cross. Joseph has passed away at this point. We don't know when he passed away, how he passed away. All we know is when Jesus started his ministry, he's no longer on the scene. As the eldest son, when Joseph passed away, Jesus was responsible for Mary. He was responsible for her housing, her food, her protection. And here he is, dying on the cross. And even in the midst of his pain, in the midst of his anguish, he's still providing for the needs of others. Because he's looking down at John and saying, you know what, I was responsible for her as her eldest son, but now you're going to be responsible in my place. You're going to take over all those things that I was supposed to provide. You're going to provide for her. And he looks at, mother, at his mother Mary. Mother, behold thy son, referring to John. Speaking, you know what? One of my last actions before I take my last breath is to make sure that even though it's an earthly physical need, I'm still going to take care of all my responsibilities. And he took care of his mother in one of his last breaths. And in the very next verse, it states right after that, he said the disciple took her home. And after this, after this, after his final action, making sure that provide, the needs of others were provided, that's when he knew that all things were accomplished. And he begins physically letting go of what he was saying. I thirst. I'm getting ready to give up the ghost. I'm getting ready to move on. It was after his last action. He was making sure that his mother was taken care of in the midst of everything. I see him providing for healing in Luke chapter 8 and verse 43 through 47. And a woman having the issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood um, stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee, and pressed thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling, and falling down before him, she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. You know, Jesus made sure that we had provision for our healing. It wasn't just physically. It wasn't just our daily needs. Bread, food, housing. You know, so many times those are the first things we go for. But Jesus made sure that our healing was taken care of. Before he even made it to the cross, he was at the whipping post. And the only reason he was at that whipping post was that we might receive healing once again. To bring back to us something that Adam lost in the garden. To redeem us spiritually, he never even had to go to the whipping post. As God, it could have been ordained from the beginning that Jesus never got whipped with the cat of nine tails. But simply he was executed, went to the cross. But that was a part of God's plan. Part of God's plan was that he would have to face the cat of nine tails, that his skin would hang off his back like ribbon, that he would be being beyond recognition, that his kidneys would be exposed, all simply that our healing might be restored to us once again. And then finally, I see that he provides for us spiritually and mentally. Luke 8 and 35. And when they went out to see what was done, being out of the man of the Gadarenes that was possessed by Legion, and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And in his right mind. They were afraid. You know, people can try to sympathize and even empathize, but only Jesus really knows what we're going through. 
Only Jesus is that friend that truly stood it closer than a brother. And only he is the one that can say, I will bring you through. I will make a way. Because he is the only one that can make a way where there is no way. When it seems like the way is impossible to pass, Jesus is there guiding us every step of the way. He was dying on the cross and the thief to his side said, remember me this day. Just remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what were Christ's words? This day you shall be with me in paradise. If we were to paraphrase it and make it a lengthy monologue, it would be, this is the whole reason I'm hanging on the cross. The whole reason I'm hanging on the cross is for you. The only reason that I am dying next to you is for you, that you may be with me today in paradise. And Jesus was the first one to die of the three. How do we know that? Because they broke the legs of the two of the others. They didn't break the legs of Christ because they knew that he was already gone. Even in death, Jesus was making a way spiritually for everyone. If Sister Beth would come to the piano, this morning, let us not forget the closeness of Christ. Others may sympathize, even empathize, but there is only one in heaven and earth and hell that really knows what you're going through. Whether it's physically, Emotionally, mentally, or spiritually, there's only one who can truly say it. I know exactly what you're going through. And his name is Jesus Christ. I don't know what you're needing this morning. I don't know what you're going through. But I can tell you, Jesus is here waiting for you this morning. He is here to help you every step of the way. He's already paid the price. He's already been born of flesh and tempted and tested and tried in every way that you and I are. He's died and gone before us and presented himself an acceptable sacrifice to the Father. them in the hand.